Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Bhoya Kaura Mohore Bhoya Kaura Mohore Edhuma Bhina Kedhayal Jagat Sam Sahade Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Krishna. The tiger, Kaya Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva, Pancha Tadva. Jaya Gaurani Thai, Gaurani Thai, Gaurani Thai, Jaya Gaurani Thai. Jaya Jaya Prabhu Pha, Prabhu Pha, Prabhu Pha, Jaya Prabhu Pha. Nithai Ghor Hari Bha Hari Bha Hari Bha Hari Bha Hari Bha Nithai Ghor Hari Bha Hari Bha Hari Bha Hari Bha Gaur Brahmanande Hari Hari Bhav Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadat Har Sri Vasari Gauda Bhakta Vinda Ki Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we'll read from 
chapter 3, Canto 2, and we'll do verses 8 and 9. Tomorrow we'll save verse 10. Purports, there's purports on all three verses, so you can't do all three today. It's not possible. <laughs> Dharma tha utamam slokam tan tu tan van pritin yajet raksakama puna janan ojakamo maruganan dharma tha utamam slokam Tan tu tan van priting yajet Raksakama puna janan Ojas kamo maru ganan Let's see Raja kamo manu devan Nritim twa bi charan yajet Kamo Kamo Yajet Toman Kamo Vire Soma Akama Purusham Param Okay, somebody can chant. You can chant both verses. Mm -hmm. Mukama Yajad so mum. Translation One should worship Lord Vishnu or his devotee for spiritual advancement in knowledge and for protection of hereditary and advancement of dynasty. One should worship the various demigods. <clears throat> One who desires domination over a kingdom or an empire should worship the Manus. One who desires victory over an enemy should worship the demons. <clears throat> and one who desires sense gratification should worship the moon. But one who desires nothing of a material enjoyment should worship the supreme personality of Godhead. Purports. The path of religion entails making progress on the path of spiritual advancement. Ultimately, reviving the eternal relationship with Lord Vishnu in his impersonal effulgence. His localized paramat feature and ultimately his person feature by the spiritual advancement in knowledge. And anyone who wants to establish a good dynasty and be happy in the temporary progress of temporary body relations 
should take shelter of the pitas and the demigods and other pious planets. Such different classes of worshippers, of different demigods, may ultimately reach the perspective planets of those demigods within the universe. But he who reaches the spiritual planets in the Brahma Jyoti achieves the highest perfection. For a liberated person, all the enjoyments listed above are considered to be absolutely useless. Only those who are conditioned by material modes of external nature are captivated by different types of material enjoyment. In other words, the transcendentalist has no material desires to be fulfilled, whereas the materialist has all types of desires to be fulfilled. The Lord has proclaimed that the materialists who desire material enjoyment and thus seek the favor of different demigods, as above mentioned, are not in control of their senses, and so they give themselves to nonsense. One should therefore not desire any sort of material enjoyment, being sensible enough to worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The leaders of nonsensical persons are still more nonsensical because they preach openly and foolishly, and one can worship any form of the demigod and get the same result. This sort of preaching is not only against the teachings of Bhagavad Gita or those of the Srimad Bhagavatam, but is also foolish. Just as it is foolish to claim that with the purchase of any travel ticket, one may reach the same destination. No one can reach Bombay from Delhi by purchasing a ticket for Baroda. It is clearly defined herein that persons impregnated with different desires have different modes of worship. But one who has no desire for material enjoyment should worship the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, the Personality of Godhead. And this worshiping process is called devotional service. Pure devotional service means service to the Lord without any tinge of material desires, including desire for fruit of activity and empirical speculation. For fulfillment of material desires, one may worship the Supreme Lord, but the results of such worship is different, as we'll have explained in the next verse. Generally, the Lord does not fulfill anyone's material desires for sense enjoyment, but he awards such benedictions to worshipers of the Lord, for they ultimately come to the point of not desiring material enjoyment. The conclusion is that one must minimize the desire for material enjoyment, and for this, one should worship the personality of Godhead, who is described here as param, or beyond anything material. Sripad Sankaracharya has also stated that I am no paro vyaktat. The Supreme Lord is beyond the material encirclement. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tas My Sri Guru Veda Maha. Sri Chaitanya Manobhistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Tadanti Swam Padantikam Maum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaura Mani Pucchari Nindir Vishishra Shunyavari Pasyat Yade Satari Nai Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Bhutananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaura Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So continuation from the previous set of verses describing more how one can achieve material benedictions through certain types of worship. Hmm. So we can think of it in this way, that if you meet a very rich person and he says, oh, you're such a wonderful person, I'm very rich, I'll give you whatever you ask for. Just ask any amount of money and I'll give it. So you say, my dear rich person, please give me 100 kunas. And he looks at you and says, 
You sure? That's all you want? Yes, just 100 kunas. That's all. I'm prepared to give you much more. Just give me 100. <laughs> so this is basically what this is indicating here, is that the worship of these demigods is like taking a few pieces of scraps from a person who is prepared to give so much more. What does that mean? It means in the sense that what can material benedictions do for a person? They can stabilize some material life for a little while and maybe bring some, what we say, perceived satisfaction, something you think, well, now I have some money, I have some power, I have some facility. But no one and everyone, this is more like a child. There's thing, two things called pervitri and nirvitri. Prabhupada explains this pervitri and nirvitri. Nirvitri means ultimate benefit. Pervitri means immediate satisfaction. <laughs> so a child will go for pervitri. The parents want to send the child to educational institution so the child can get the proper training, but the child wants to play. Well, the child doesn't know its best interests, so it just thinks if I can just play, that's what I want to do. But the parents actually know that one should prepare for one's future life, therefore they, they know what is best for the child. So this pervitri and nirvitri means that immediate satisfaction, ultimate welfare. So what is the ultimate welfare? The ultimate welfare is to engage in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When one achieves devotional service to the Supreme Lord, one achieves everything. Everything is included in that. Not only everything, but there is nothing else that one will ever desire when they connect in devotional service with the Lord. Because devotional service is so fulfilling and satisfying. It's called susukam kartam avyayam. It's the highest principle of, of spiritual happiness. And it brings one unlimited, what we say, happiness in all categories of existence, no matter what one is doing. So if one wants to trade that opportunity for the opportunity to get a few trinkets, just like we have the example of uh, Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj was a very young boy. He was with his stepbrother. His wife, his father had two wives, Su Suruchi and and Suchitra, Suruchi and Suruchi and Suchitra. Yeah. So Dhruva was the son of one, and he had another wife, and so. The king was playing with both boys. So one boy, the not Truva, but his stepbrother, was sitting on the lap of the king. So Druva wanted to sit on his father's lap too. But as soon as he tried to do that, his stepmother pushed him off and said, you cannot sit there, this is for my son. So he was, he's a Kshatriya, although he's only five years old. He was completely insulted. He went away with tears in his eyes, came to his mother, and was crying. And he said, I want to get revenge from my stepmother. She insulted me. Well, his, his mother, Suchitra, I think it, her name was, she said, well, anyone who wants to uh, succeed in life must seek out God. She, he said, well, where's God? She said, God can be found in the forest. Immediately, he left home and went to the forest. 
And then he started performing austerities. And the austerities that Dhruva Maharaj performed at five years old, it's impossible to imitate or even understand. At first he was eating just fruits and roots from the trees, and then he was just eating some leaves. After, he, after that he was just, uh, just breathing some air, taking a little water, then it was only air. Finally, Narada Muni came back around and saw this young boy performing austerities. He said, go home. You're just a young boy. Come back. You can do all this stuff when you get older. Dhruva said, well, you know. And he also said, you know, you shouldn't be so interested in taking revenge against something. That is not, you know, a devotee doesn't do that. He said, well, basically, whatever you're saying is very nice, but it's not for me. <laughs> It's not for me. So if you can give me something different, I'll listen. But don't, don't try to discourage me. So Narada Muni was inspired by that. And so he gave him a mantra. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And he told him that you meditate on the form of the Lord by meditating on his different parts of his body at different times of the meditation. So he practiced that meditation and he was chanting Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, which is the Maha Mantra that was chanted in, in uh, the previous Yuga, in Dwarpa Yuga. And so that went on for a long time. After a while, he was so much in trance, meditating on the Lord and chanting within his heart, that he lost all forms of external consciousness. Now he was standing on one leg. He was really determined. He was thinking, I want a kingdom better than my father, better than my grandfather, and better than my great-grandfather. There was no such kingdom available. His father was Uttanapada, the king of the world. His grandfather was Swayambhuvamano, the king of the universe. And his great-grandfather was Lord Brahma, the highest personality within the universe. <laughs> and so and he was thinking, this is what I want. I'm going to see the Lord, and then I'm going to ask for these things. So he kept performing his austerities. So much so that he actually started to regulate his breathing, that he was breathing once every few days, just taking in a little air. His austerities were so powerful that it actually caused difficulty throughout the universe. Standing on one leg, chanting the mantras, meditating on the Lord, and breathing every once in a while. He had mastered the yoga system. Powerful, five-year-old boy. The demigods in the higher planets were getting disturbed because their planets were shaking due to his austerities. In fact, it became so difficult that they couldn't manage their planets. The whole universe was becoming shaken simply by his austerities. Prabhupada describes something interesting. He says, how is it possible that his austerities affected the whole universe? And Prabhupada gives a nice analogy to help us understand he said, if you're riding in an airplane and the airplane is going 700 miles an hour, are you going 700 miles an hour? Yes, because you're connected to the airplane. So he connected himself with the universal breath and became the center of the universe through his austerities. Therefore, everything was evolving around his austerities. And this was causing disturbance. Finally, the demigods couldn't take it anymore. So they went to Lord Vishnu and said, you know, this is your devotee here. This is what's happening. Do something. <laughs> we have to manage the affairs. This is our service to you. We can't manage. So help us. So the Lord manifested a form, -arm form called Prishnigarbha, one of the Vishnu forms of the Lord called Prishnigarbha. He had a conch in one hand, a lotus flower, disc, club. He appeared. When Dhruva saw the Lord, he appeared right in front of Dhruva, right where Dhruva was. 
He opened his eyes and there the Lord was standing in front of him. He immediately paid his obeisances, full dundabouts. And when he saw the Lord, he couldn't speak. He was so much overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord. He was in ecstasy, unable to speak. So the Lord did something. The Lord took his conch shell and touched the head of Dhruva, and little Dhruva. And as soon as he did that, Dhruva became enlightened with prayers, and he started offering beautiful prayers to the Lord. Those prayers are in the Bhagavatam, but there was one prayer that was not mentioned in the Bhagavatam. It's mentioned in another scripture called the Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, and that explains his final prayer. And what was that prayer? My dear Lord, I have been chasing after broken pieces of glass, and now I have found the most rarest of all gems. <laughs> and he was feeling bad because he had desired something material. When he saw the Lord, he realized all his material desires were just like broken glass. I don't know about in your country, but people in America, they break into cars by smashing the windshields and then they steal the car. <laughs> I know maybe they do that here too. Not so much. <laughs> That's a common affair in Western countries, especially in the US. Now sometimes we would see broken glass on the ground. You know, all this broken glass, somebody's windshield was smashed. And we would think, boy, I wish somebody would come along and clean it up. It's just, you know, dangerous and it's just a nuisance. So when you look at it, you think broken pieces of glass, what is that? It's just, you know, something, you know, undesirable. So he was thinking in the same way. My desire to have a kingdom greater than my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather is like asking for broken pieces of glass. Can you imagine? A kingdom higher than, than Brahma? There's no such place. And uh, the Lord was really pleased, and Dhruva was really kind of unhappy because he had asked for something so insignificant compared to now he had the darshan of the Lord. Simply by having a darshan of the Lord, all his senses became separately enlivened. All the bodily senses became enlivened by the presence of the Lord. He was feeling complete joy. But the Lord was so kind, the Lord gave him a kingdom anyway. <laughs> he gave him the pole star, which is the highest planet in the universe, where the Saptarishis, the seven great sages, constantly circle that planet. And on that planet is an island called Swetadweep, and on that planet, the Lord resides there in his Vishnu form. So Dhruva got a planet higher than even Lord Brahma, which was Lord Krishna's, Lord Vishnu's planet in the material universe. Because in every material universe, the Lord has a his own planet, which he manages the affairs from the universe with that, with, from that planet. It's an ocean of milk. It's called Swetadweep. <laughs> and uh, Dhruva became the uh, emperor of that planet. And he ruled for 36,000 years, celestial years, like that. This is an interesting story, but the main point that we want to really bring out is that here was something so fantastic that it can't be compared to any material desires that anyone can have on any planet, which people so are so interested in chasing after. If I get a good wife, if I have some good wealth, if I have a nice position in society, if I have good intelligence, if I'm strong in body, if I have a lot of knowledge, people are chasing after these things. But if you become Krishna conscious, you get all that <laughs> if you want it. The devotees don't want it. But how does Krishna gives it anyway? That if you need it, 
for your service, Krishna will give it to you. Just because the devotee doesn't want it for themselves, but it's available if Krishna, if the devotee wants it to be used in Krishna's service like that. So all these things that are being mentioned here, which sound quite fantastic, are just insignificant compared to taking shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. Devotional service is so satisfying that, um, yeah, we have the example, Dhruva Maharaj is the, is the prime example of how having you know, so many other desires for something material, he saw it as so insignificant, so useless like that. So the goal of our Krishna consciousness movement is not to try to chase after these things. One has to be, one has to engage in ananya bhakti. Bhakti, which is free from any personal desire. And Rupa Goswami gives the formula, Ayabhila Sita Sunya Jnana Karmana Navrita Manakulena Krishna Silanam Bhakti Uttamam. That desire that has no personal gain through fruit of activity, philosophical speculation, trying to please Krishna by serving Krishna. That's bhakti. And Therefore, when one absorbs himself in bhakti, Krishna directly, we were speaking about this yesterday afternoon in our little conference, Krishna directly within the heart guides the devotee back to him. What is that verse? Tesham Tesham Evanu Kampartam Agyam Acham Ahanu Tesham evanu kampartam aham jnana tyam tamaha nasyayam yatma bhavasto jnana dipena basvata. I, dwelling within their hearts, destroy with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness born of ignorance. So ignorance comes from identification with this body and the extensions of the body. Having a material body means the principle of ignorance, to identify with it. And from that principle, all other forms of ignorance follow. Jai si sigornitai ki jai. So a devotee doesn't look towards this material world, towards anything. Well, once when one becomes a devotee, what happens is that Krishna starts to purify him through the process of devotional service. Then whatever material desires become more and more subtle. And then one wants to become popular. One wants to become glorified. One wants to have a nice position in spiritual circles. In other words, the accoloids, or we call it the benedictions that come by way of the service People seek that in a personal way in order to fulfill some desire for something, some subtle prestige or some subtle position. But the devotee knows all this is, what is the verse? Shrama eva hi kevalam. <laughs> Useless waste of time. <laughs> Therefore, just chant the holy names of the Lord. And by chanting the holy names of the Lord, we develop susukam kartam avyayam. Uh, what is that verse? Cheto darpana marjanam, bhava maha devagni nirvapanam, shreya kaibra vichandrika vitaranam vidha vathu jivanam, anandam budi vardhanam, patipadam punam ritasvardhanam, sarvatma snaparamparam vijayate shri krishna sankirtanam. So one who engages in the Sankirtan in the movement, Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam. Ananda means bliss, ecstatic happiness. And Bhuti means deep. And Vardhanam in this case means ocean. So 
the happiness that one derives from chanting the Hare Krishna is like an unlimited deep ocean of nectar. There's no limit. So therefore, this is this is where we can find satisfaction through chanting, through serving in different words, worshiping the Lord. As soon as, as we, if we can just focus our mind on whatever we do as the ultimate principle of happiness and, and engage within that, then we don't have to worry about what am I getting this? Prashadam will always be there. And Krishna will always make sure you have enough whatever you need. Clothes will be there. If you get sick, medicine will come. So everything is there. We don't have to worry about these things. All we have to do is concern ourselves with how to serve in the best possible way. That's all. And that that alone, and then of course chanting the holy names of the Lord is uh, it awakens bhakti within the heart and inspires one to uh, uh, surrender more and more to Krishna in devotion. And one develops susukam kartavam yayam, unlimited forms of happiness, anandam buddhi vardhanam. So this happiness for material enjoyment looks good sometimes. Yeah, boy, I can be powerful over my enemies. Boy, that's nice. I can have a lot of knowledge. I can be strong like, you know, Hercules. I can be, you know, I can have a lot of girls, so many girls, too many girls. <laughs> They're all chanting my glories. So many things, right? What else can you get here? You know, you can get good health, power, unlimited way, unwealth, <clears throat> whatever you want material. There's a process for achieving it through worshiping at the devas in a particular way, if you're qualified. <laughs> but Krishna, the devotee, doesn't want any of that because he knows it's just it's a waste of time. So here, um, Prabhupada, of course, makes this point over and over again that the Lord does not fulfill desires for material enjoyment, but sometimes he does in order just to please his devotee, he'll give his devotee something material. So the devotee, he wants to reciprocate like that. Just like uh, we have the example of Prahlad Maharaj. After Harani Kashipu was killed by Nisringadev, Pallad was there, and none of the demigods could approach nor Nisringadev. He was really ferocious. He was just like growling like crazy. So Lak De Subrama was there. With the, Shiva said, "I'm not going." You know, the, the various demigods said, "We're not going." And then Brahma came over to Lakshmi and said, "Lakshmi, that's your husband." She said, you go, you go and pacify him. She said, I've never seen him in that way before. I'm not going. <laughs> Nobody could go. And Shringade was still angry after killing Rani Kashipu. It's a little Perlad. He came with a garland. And he had you can see the picture of Perlad is trying to garland the killer, putting the garland on. <laughs> and uh, the Lord just looked at Perlad. And then the Lord Prahlad came and sat on the Lord's lap, and the Lord became completely peaceful. Lord Nishringadev has eight different moods, from completely peaceful to completely ugra, where he's ferociously angry. <clears throat> that, that ugra manifestation, when he comes out of the pillar, he breaks through the pillar, that's the, the ultimate principle of his uh, ferociousness. <clears throat> but he also is very peaceful, like a little, like a, like a giant pussycat or something. <laughs> so Prahlad Maharaj is there. So Prahlad Maharaj is offering nice prayers, and the Lord is so pleased with Prahlad Maharaj's bhakti that he offers him a benediction. He says, you know, I'm, I want to give you something because of your love for me. I just want to offer something to you. Ask whatever you want. 
Prahlad Maharaj said, I'm not a vanik, I'm not a merchant. I don't worship you to get something from it. I worship you because of my love for you, that's all. And the Lord was insistent. The Lord kept pushing. Come on, take something. The Lord wanted to just show his, you know, his gratitude to Prahlad. So finally, Prahlad said, all right, if you want to give me something, then uh, liberate my father. The Lord said, you don't have to ask for that. that was, that's already done. <laughs> ask for something else. So Prahlad finally said, all right, you really want to give me something. Let me stay in this material world and simply become your instrument to, to, to give Krishna consciousness to all these fools and rascals who are making up this crazy material civilization. That was his prayer. He simply wanted to benedict others. That's all he wanted. When the Lord heard that, the Lord was so, so happy and so personally moved within his own heart that, you know, they say he's the best of all devotees, Prahlad Maharaj. Okay, so these are a little bit of how devotional service really attracts them, the attention of the Lord and how the Lord becomes so dear to the devotee and how the devotee becomes so dear to the Lord. Why anyone who wants to trade that for some... Uh, some some trinkets of this world, which is eventually going to be lost anyway in time. As Prabhupada says here, what is he uses the word foolish? <laughs> this word he uses the word, yeah, where is it? Yeah, he says the sort of pre this sort of preaching. You know, the leaders of nonsensical persons are still more nonsensical because they preach openly and foolishly that one can worship any form of the demigod. This sort of preaching is foolish, and it's even more foolish that you can uh, simply, you know, worship the demigods and get whatever you want. Or you can worship in any, any particular way and get whatever any way you want. So, yeah, so we can understand how what we say useless it is or what we say, how it deters our direction in spiritual life towards something useless. We waste time for material benedictions. Because they're all going to be all gone and sooner or later. And a lot of times, just like we see, there is an example in the in uh, Western countries. They have this thing called a lottery, where you put some money down and you can win a large amount of money. So somebody wins. So they win like you know six million dollars or eight million dollars, sometimes even more. So after many years of this, they decided to do, do a little survey to meet the people who were winners of the lotteries every year and see how their lives were changed, affected. So they did that. And they found that most people, the large majority, their life became more miserable. They had all this money. Now people were after them. Some people were after, actually, the relatives were wanting to kill them so they could get the money. And... Um, in other cases, they were just using the money for sense gratification, which destroyed their life. They became unhealthy and sick for excess sense gratification. Or they had so many calamities in life just because they had money. So, yeah. So one thinks, well, I got something, you know, beneficial, but it's not guaranteed even from the material perspective. You chase after a nice girl, and everything's nice for the first month. And then after that, then the marriage goes to hell, right? <laughs> so, there's a Chinese saying. It says, if you want to be happy for one hour, 
take a take a nap, rest. If you want to be happy for one day, go on a picnic or go to the beach. <laughs> if you want to be happy for one month, get married. And if you want to be happy for a lifetime, serve others. <laughs> Interesting Chinese saying. <laughs> hmm? You can make, he can serve God. You can make, a, no, 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 no. Well, the one that was printed in the book that I have <laughs> is different. <laughs> I don't know if you can be happy your whole life doing gardening. Unless you do Krishna's garden. <laughs> Krishna's garden will make you happy your whole life. <laughs> yeah. Some, some twist. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to be happy, chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay, we have questions. Mr. G. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for your lecture, Your Holiness. Um, is it material or, or is it simply realistic because it is out of intention to satisfy God and um, how to understand the circumstances which are, uh, which are arranged and why why do I have something against arrangements? Uh, the brother of my uh, father is a singer. My uncle is a very rich man who possesses a lot of uh, instruments to uh, give uh, all of the artists in Serbia and famous artists around Serbia to um, arrange concerts for them and light and everything what they need, uh, microphones and he's one of the top most uh, possessors of such equipment and i i have developed through my youth a very uh, strong uh, attachment to metal music and to uh, worshiping god because i was all my life religious and one, once it, it mixed simply into one thing and now i understand it always appears as a wish that uh, this is the most fulfilling thing that i can achieve in my life to do um, very, very hard metal mantras. and <laughs> But the, the arrangement, the pushing that my, um, my uncle is not helping me and uh, the, the understanding that I have to un, uh, respect authorities and uh, my, my status right now, that I can simply out of nothing start to record very holy mantras and with a very hard sound and with uh, screamings and effects and doing something modern out of it. Well, that's not holy. Yeah, I, I would... Uh, uh, you can't... You know, unless... You go to heavy metal, holy rock? Is that you're talking about? <laughs> there are people who do that. But, you know, I've been to one of those concerts and you want to run out as fast as you can. We, we did it in, in Cross Maidan in, in 2005. Big one. We had these all these rock and roll, you know, singers come and they were all doing Krishna conscious lyrics, but you know the music was so so debilitating that you just wanted to run out of there. And I saw people leaving really fast. I left. I couldn't handle it because my whole body was shaking. <laughs> After that, and I, I suffered a lot just by hearing that, that it does. Because if you understand music, and you do understand music, that there is different expressions of music which work on different parts of the body. Rock and roll works on the lower chakra, which is the chakra at the base of the spine, which, in, which excites sensuality. That's why rock and roll music is to doom to doom. It works opposite to the heartbeat. That's why people go to concerts 
and they hear rock and roll music and they scream. They actually become crazy sometimes. This heavy metal stuff, I'm not talking about regular rock and roll, heavy metal. It just makes people crazy. They actually just go crazy. You probably saw that. Yeah. Um, and that's that is created by the demons, this heavy metal stuff. It's actually a demonic intervention into this world. They've taken rock and roll from its very pristine, natural, sweet beginning and changed it into something, you know, very heavy and harsh. So now if you study music, different types of music work on the different chakras. Bhajans work on the heart chakra. So when you do bhajans, even the music itself, the theme itself is opening, that theme is working on the heart. So the heart is opening and then with the lyrics there, it brings about, you know, a whole understanding of an image along with the opening of the heart. And that is bhajan. Bhajan is a science. It's coming from the spiritual world. So that's the source of all music. I studied this. One person uh, forgot her name. She was she was giving many seminars on how music works on different parts of the body. So yeah, you know, and then you have jazz. <laughs> You have, uh, what else there is? Symphonic music. Symphonic music is also works higher levels of consciousness, symphonies, you know, like Bach and Beethoven. But Baroque music, Baroque music is the best of all the Western music styles because you can chant mantras to Baroque. Though some devotees were chanting Japa to Baroque music. It's so celestial and so serene because it's actually coming from the religious tradition, the Baroque tradition. Like that. So all these different types of ex musical expressions work on different parts of one's existence and open up different energy sources in the body. So this heavy metal is the lowest and it just stimulates sensuality. <laughs> and drug addiction. <laughs> and that's planned by the demons. Mm -hmm. But if I understand that, I'm not so, going to go... If you, use it, if you want to use that, you want to connect it to Krishna conscious lyrics, you know, you might find a small little group that's interested in that, but serious devotees will never take to, 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 to that. And that's what I feel. It's not about a devotee. It's, it's simply just to fulfill this tribal feeling that this has to be done because people do no, it. it's already being done. And I'm not, and the I'm not satisfied feelings, with it. The tribal feelings are already out there. People are already doing it. Yeah, but I'm not satisfied with their taste. I have an, another tribal taste because we're doing Tilak. And, I, and I've experienced all the new metal since since, it's, since are beginning. You, are you familiar with, uh, what's his name? Tatiksha Karunika? No. no he's, he did rock and roll music in America. And he's a devotee. I know him personally. He was the first one to start rock and roll Krishna conscious music. And then it spread. And now there's many groups now in India, especially in India now, are doing all this stuff. But, you know, you have to understand the expression is a large part of the experience and not just the words itself. Now, if you're going to get into heavy metal and you're going to create, people's minds are going to be somewhat, you know, in that mood. So when people, when we were doing it, and when we did it in this one program in Mumbai, 2005, you know, people were going up on the stage and doing break dancing, you know. <laughs> so you don't dance like this to, you know, Hare Krishna rock and roll. You know, it's just like, it's not, it doesn't lift the spirits up. It's just heavy metal. It works on the heart to create a type of unhappiness within this society. And then you just want to, you know, it brings about anger and it brings about sensuality. That's expression. Now, if you want to attach Hare Krishna words to it, it makes it a little bit better. But no, 
no decent person wants to. Now, if you want to use that for preaching to the, to the outside world, there is an audience out there for that. And devotees are already doing it. There is Hare Krishna rock. It's going on. You can look it up. But it's not heavy metal. They're not yeah. using heavy metal. That heavy metal stuff is just like what it is, heavy metal. If somebody drops a, an iron bar on your head, that's what it is, heavy metal. So uh, yeah. if that's your goal in life, and then uh, you don't have I, my blessings at all. I see my goal in life more in <laughs> I don't think you're going to get much blessings either. The rap music has to be destroyed, and one can only do that when one is heavier and more precise and direct on the heart as them because well, they do I don't agree, a lot I don't of parables. With, I don't agree with that premise. Rap music has to be destroyed. It has to be destroyed. It it, it conquers everyone's mind because it's attractive. Uh, but if it, you do Krishna conscious rap, it's good. No, nah, that's not that's not heavy enough. Metal no, with, with mantras. It's, that, it's, not a matter of, it's not a matter of heaviness. It's a matter of how it's going to affect your Krishna consciousness. It's not about me. It's just setting up a new level of, of being heavy and being something better than the ones who say I'll we kill, we have tattoos, we drugs. It's just a heaviness. It's just a holy heaviness. It's just a heaviness that can't be There's no reached. such thing as a holy heaviness. That's your own interpretation. There's no such thing. Yeah. Well, if you want to do it, nobody's going to stop you. But no, I mean, is it, I, I don't see any, any uh, bad motivation behind that. No, but the results won't be. You'll, you'll, you know, after they're done, they're going to pass you a weed to smoke. You know, here have a after you have your heavy metal Krishna consciousness, they'll give you something to keep the intoxication going. It it inspires that kind of mood within, and and this is the type of audience you're going to get. That's the thing. I don't want to cause them to have something more than just the music. I want that that, that the music becomes that uh, substance connect with with the uh, it is possible uh, connect with the Hare Krishna rock and roll now it's going it's out there but heavy metal I um, yeah, heavy metal is like getting hit with a giant frying pan you know yeah. you don't even hear the lyrics all you hear is this the, the loud sounds that's all that's, you do that's the bad ones <laughs> yeah so what, what's the effect going to be? You're going to, you know, after you're done, you're just going to lay down and want to go to sleep. That's the best thing. It's useless. We have the bhajans. The bhajans are so beautiful. You know how many different bhajan tunes there are? There's over, there's over 10,000 bhajan, different bhajan tunes. And search out the bhajans and the music that's connected with the bhajan, different types of bhajan lyrics, and the, uh, musical expressions. That's a whole science. That'll take you many lifetimes to learn. If you're interested in music, there's an ocean of interesting you know, musical expressions that can be used in different types of instrumentations. It's just unlimited. And there's a whole science in the Vedas also, about music and the, what is it? The Samaveda is all, you know, music expressions. So I didn't, I didn't get the support from the king, and yeah. now I seek for the support from the, from the God Himself. Mm -hmm. So there is not nothing wrong. This is the same thing like Jorva did. He doesn't let me. He doesn't give me the benediction which he, which he could give me simply. I don't understand what you just said. What are you saying? Uh, Druva uh, didn't have the permission to be uh, the son and to sit on the lap of, of mm. the king. Mm -hmm. I don't have the permission to use everything what I could use to bring that onto into. Well, if you action. know if you know music, just pick pick that music which is pleasing. You said you have uh, you know relatives and connections with somebody knows all kinds of music. So. Why, why heavy metal? That's the thing I'm against. I, I feel what, what has to be done. I, I hear that this has to be done. 
I, I, a rapper will always have an argue and will argue with me. I, I, if I leave space for arguing about taste between connecting holy music and metal music, which is very, very modern in now, there is no space for arguing. This is simply the highest point. And there, there is no uh, what do you take mean? drugs and- There's uh, no such thing as, what do you, you, highest point, what do you mean? You, that's a word you just threw in there. There's no high point there. Um, people, um, Eminem, for example, is a rapper and he's, he's accepted by the whole, uh, uh, by everyone as a rap god. There is nothing better than- but He's him. material. Yes. Yeah, but we have Krishna conscious rappers too. You know that. Have you ever come across them? No. No, they're there. There was one called Bhakta. Bhakti. His name was Bhakti. He was a famous Krishna conscious rapper. And there's a few more that are still out there. That's nice. R rap is rhyme. You usually rhyme. I don't like rap. I like rhyme. Rhyme is nice. You can use Krishna conscious rhyme to express something and put it to music too. You want to hear one? Rhyme? Why not? Yeah. Repeat after me. Yes. His name is Balarama. Balarama. His he's, name was Balarama. He's better than Obama. He's better than Obama. What to speak of Osama. <laughs> what to speak about Osama. He'll take all your karma. He'll take away your karma. 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 He'll bring you to the Holy Dharma. He'll bring you to the Holy Dharma. And the ultimate Parikrama. And the ultimate Parikrama. Jai Balarama. Jai Balarama. Okay. Jai Maharaj. <laughs> now you got something to work with. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Glorify Lord Balaram. <laughs> so we can do that with rhyme. And you can do it with rap too. Make music. Yeah. If that's what you I really want. But if you're gonna use heavy metal, all you're gonna all people are gonna hear is the sound. They're not gonna hear any words. Not that heavy metal. <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. So I don't know if we should end on heavy metal or light metal. <laughs> okay. Oh, glory to Sri Sri Godan Itai, who are the king of all dancers. <laughs> Gor Nataraj Kijai. Nitai Gor Nataraj Kijai. They are always dancing, they are always in Kirtan. Srila <laughs> Prabhupada Kijai. <laughs> 